can I accept this person exactly how they are? Mm -hmm. For me to say I love them, but I'm expecting them to be this fantasy version, that is not loving this person. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show. This is Inner Archaeology. I'm Emily. I'm Sarah. And we're, I'm like very excited about today's topic because it is been a pattern in my life, I have to admit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so why don't you like uh, take it away because it was your, yeah. it was your yeah. idea and I don't know mm -hmm. quite where it came from, but it's brilliant. So tell me, tell me about this. Yes. So I recently had a, a friend just reach out to me just with some questions about their relationship. And I was mm -hmm. noticing this very familiar thing, which mm -hmm. is this idea that when you're somebody who can see the best in somebody, when you could see their potential, mm -hmm. when you could see how they might be if they were healed or more confident or more in alignment, that can sometimes be like... It could be a blessing, but it also can be a curse in a huge mm -hmm. way because I think it can lead people to have these expectations for somebody that they are unable to meet because they are not the person that you're expecting them to be. And it turns around and causes a ton of pain. And, and it's something that is so unconscious like people do this all the time in their this relationships is literally all of my relations all of my romantic relationships <laughs> just all of them across until the now <laughs> until now and i i think uh, listen when you cause yourself so much pain in this area i used to have like a little mantra after like my last mm -hmm. long-term relationship where i was like see people as they are like, not as you, mm. like, know they can be. Or, like, another one I would tell myself is, like, when somebody shows you who they are, like, pay attention. Like, this is, like, it's not the ideal version of them that's, like, actively, like, alive and living right now. And when you, when you set these expectations or – the thing is, is, like, it's confusing because, at least for me and a younger version of me, like, this doesn't – it didn't feel like something – I was doing that was like bad or harmful right it was like mm. I see the best in this person like you have so much more potential to be like better or happier or like healthier or just like so you know and then you realize that you actually the thing is, is that what I realized it's not even just that you create yourself pain but you create pain in that person too absolutely because they feel kind of like you're a dis they kind of feel like a disappointment because you're 100%. just like yeah you you think that they should be at like further along in their growth process than they are and so they feel like they're falling short of your own like ideals of them so it's painful for mm -hmm. both parties honestly um mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I just have done this so much in my life <laughs> and it does you, yeah. you bring up such a good point like it feels like this really like good part hopeful. of you like it feels like it comes yeah. from a really good part of you yeah you're but hopeful. it turns around and it causes so much pain and yeah makes mm -hmm. the other person feel like they're just never going to live up to your expectations and mm -hmm. I've seen this play out in in so many different relationships and and it it's like this concept of radical acceptance like if for you th this is kind of like this belief that I'm workshopping that in order for me to truly love somebody I have to accept them exactly how they are yes like for me to say I love them but I'm expecting them to be this fantasy version that I have come up with them like in my mind that does not that is not loving this person that is me loving some fantasy character mm -hmm. and um I have like you have to like come face to face with that and be like you know, in, in, in your relationships, be like, can I accept this person exactly how they are? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. and if the answer is no, then you need to like get out of that relationship or create some major boundaries, or mm -hmm. you need to do the work around like, how do I actually really love this person and the relationship as it is, as mm -hmm. opposed to mm -hmm. the relationship as I've been dreaming it up to be. 
right? Totally. Totally. Gosh, there's so, I have so many like thoughts and they're all like colliding with each other because I think what I've come, I think it really took me seeing the pain it was causing the other person for Mm -hmm. me to kind of like stop because it's hard, right? There's a difference between like, like I think in my relationship with Ben, we really hold each other accountable and we remind each other like, Hey, this is what you want to be better at. And like, we're mirrors for each other. I don't think I do this thing with him that I used to do with partners. And honestly, okay, this is kind of a weird story, especially like, (laughs) but like a bit, one of the ways I came to this realization was actually through a mega like mushroom trip. (laughs) That was like Uh one of the things that like the universe like came down and like cupped my little face and was like, you have to let this person evolve on their own journey. Mm -hmm. This is like years ago. And you're not like you are causing them harm by trying to like wow. drag them along on your mm-hmm. timeline when they're not ready to like heal, grow, be better, feel better in their own skin. And um, it was like, I don't know, it was just such a like insane realization. And it feels I feel like I almost like can't put it into words, obviously, because it's like hard to put into words those kinds of experiences. Also mushrooms. <laughs> right. Cause it was like literally yeah. like it was like, stop doing this thing. You're not helping. And you think you're helping. Like, cause that's the thing. Like I really thought that I was like helping this person become a more like realized version of themselves, right? Mm-hmm. And then I realized it was just mm-hmm. causing them tremendous pain. Um Wow. And it wasn't, like, until that that I, like, realized that fully. And I think, like, actually integrated it into how I, like, interact with people a little bit better. Yeah, I just, I don't know. This is such an important topic because it's it's so much of it. It's just, I I really just think the confusion of it all lies in the fact that when you do this with people, it usually comes from, like, a naive, hopeful, caring, loving place. And when something comes from that place, it's almost harder to pinpoint that this is actually harmful. Yes. Because it's not coming from like a manipulative part of you or or an angry part of you. It comes from like a really genuinely good part of you. And so it's Mm. confusing. Um, Yeah. uh, So much pain has been caused by this in life. Yeah. (laughs) I know. I feel like when I was first kind of wrapping my head around this idea – was right after my mom died, Mm -hmm. I had all these, instantly had all these subconscious expectations for how I needed my dad to be, Mm. like, in the wake of my mom's death, Mm -hmm. Um, and I needed him, how I needed him to meet my needs, and how I needed him to show up, Mm -hmm. and I remember getting really frustrated because it wasn't happening exactly how I wanted it to happen and I had and it took me a while like it took me a solid while for me to like wade through my own anger or disappointment and pain already in the midst of the pain of losing my mom and land here Mm -hmm. with like what we're talking about and realizing like if I want a relationship with my dad and it's it's changed now that my mom's gone like it's kind of a new thing I I have to see him exactly how he is Mm -hmm. like and and like and love him there and as soon as I came to that place it's been great yeah (laughs) like it's been wonderful and I've had this wonderful relationship with my dad because I'm not putting all this pressure on to for him to be my mom or Mm -hmm. anybody else other than Mm -hmm. who he is and and I and I do think it okay this is the area where this this idea gets a little tricky and I would love your thoughts on this but when you're in relationship with somebody and when you actually like have an ask or you need an adjustment in behavior or you need something to change in somebody like there's this kind of like juxtaposition around radical acceptance versus um for the viability of our relationship and the well-being of our relationship, I need this adjustment. Mm-hmm. I know that I need mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. Um, and and having that ask, because that is part of relationship too. It's it's part of like having that 
where you're figuring out to fit, how to fit together and there's compromise and power struggles and stuff like that. And you make adjustments for your partner in order for them to feel very loved. I think that's distinct from radical excitement. Like, I think both of those can exist at the same time. What I have found is like the key element. Like when people come to me and they're like, how do I get my partner to, to like meet my needs in this area? What I ask is, are they willing to even hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. And if I get back, no, they can't even like admit that I like have this need or there's this issue. That's when I'm like, I'm like, if there's not willingness there in your partnership for adjustment and change, there's not, your only options are radical acceptance or moving on. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like those are the the only two choices, right? Mm Mm-hmm. It's interesting that you went that direction with it because when you were talking, I went kind of a different direction because I was thinking about how there's Mm. like different things in relationships where it's like there's there's times I think where, well, one, radical acceptance like for sure can sometimes be the only option, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. And that also I think is more true for people who you're not in a romantic relationship with right because when you're in a romantic relationship with somebody it's different in the sense that you guys are actively trying to create like a relationship together where you both feel really good and supported and loved and safe and like and like happy when it's a relationship with like a parent or a friend right sometimes it's like I mean do we want to go there? I mean, like sometimes that's the question is like, do I actually have the energy or capacity to try and go there with this friend? Do I think they want to go there? Um, Mm -hmm. I have learned more often than not, people do want to go there and we think that they don't. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's always like willing. There's always, I think, I think it's always a good idea to give it a whirl um, because you might surprise yourself and you kind of have nothing to lose at the end of the day. If it's something that's Mm -hmm. genuinely you think going to make your relationship better. But what I've learned is that there's an important distinction. And this is where my brain kind of went while you were talking between, and I don't actually kind of know how to put this into words because I've never like had this thought before until we were talking, but it's a, it's a distinction between things that you are going to ask of your partner to do to make you feel safer in the relationship or is it something you're just asking them to do because it like drives you nuts or like you're trying to control them or like change a particular thing about them oh, and, the, and what is the motive like what is the, the ask? right yeah. and it's like is it bother you that they have some sort of vice like they may be like I don't know drink coke zero all day long <laughs> And like what nobody in particular. Not not <laughs> not saying any names. Um just, yeah. but it's like and so the question the question is is like am I am I like nagging or asking for this change because it's ultimately gonna make her relationship better, or is it because it's my judgments and my opinions around yes. them being a better version of themselves? When in reality, like mm. this person might be really fucking healthy in all other areas of their life. And they got this one vice. And it's like, you know what? Like, let them have that vice. Like, let them, like, if that's the thing, yes. that's the mm. worst thing. And you're nagging your partner because they, like, have an unhealthy habit or a habit that you just don't like. Um, I think it's important to, like, look at that. I always think of, a, I had a friend in college uh, right after college, she got married and she really, she hated like weed. She was like, like almost like now that looking back at it, I'm like, what happened that she was like, so like judgmental and angry at people who smoked weed Wow. and her partner Mm -hmm. liked to smoke weed every now and then, which like, I don't know. And it got to the point where she was so judgmental about it that he hid it from her and then she caught him. And then she was horrified mm-hmm. that now he's lying. And I remember like watching this whole situation play out because she would come to me about it. And I was like, I feel like you kind of pushed it underground with your judgments. You made an unsafe yeah. place yeah. for him to like do something that is honestly like relatively harmless, especially in the way he was partaking mm-hmm. in it. It wasn't like he was getting high all day long and like couldn't function. And like, you know what right. I mean? Like there's like right. nuance, right? So I just, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to say here is I think it's important to like ask yourself if the things you're asking of your partner, what is the end, end thing? Like, is it, is it really like going to benefit your relationship or is it just like a personal preference and a judgment that maybe you need to work on? 
because right. like a pet peeve like a pet peeve or, yeah, or something because exactly. I'll never forget when I was like I always give Ben Ben always leaves the lights on and it comes I'm pretty sure from his mom who didn't like coming home to a dark house so she she didn't like house the house being dark she felt unsafe so Ben has this belief that it's like safer when the lights are on I came from a classic dad electricity is money turn off the lights what are you doing you know uh you're killing the environment like i don't know all the things yeah and so we're constantly like having this like little battle of like lights on lights off right classic example i think Mm -hmm. and ben looked at me one day and he was like you could keep getting upset at me about these lights being on or maybe you could just like get over it <laughs> and like not let it bother you because at the end of the day like mm-hmm. how big of a deal is it really and I was just like mm-hmm. mm, I don't like that but it's not like wrong yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean so I just think that's an important yeah. distinction to make because I think in p- relationships sometimes it's a subtle like difference of opinion and ultimately in the grand scheme of life and how you feel like safe it's not a big fucking deal, right? It's just a differences and opinions mm-hmm. and how you like move throughout your like day. Now you're living together trying to navigate that. But then there are times where you're like, hey, my love language is words of affirmation. You don't, you don't right. naturally do that. And so I feel unsure or surprised when you do like say something loving. And I would not like to feel so surprised. <laughs> And feel more like Mm -hmm. sure in our relationship and like you and feel loved. Mm -hmm. And like that's a completely different ask because that's how you feel like good and safe in your relationship. So I just, I don't know. I just think that like those distinctions are important because I see, I think we just naturally kind of want to like bend our partner closer to like our own preferences. And some of them are important and some of them are silly, you know? Yeah. And it kind of goes both ways too, right? You need to have willingness to make your make adjustments yourself to like, I don't know, really love your partner well. Mm. Um, yeah, I just I think it was like the what what kind of sparked this whole thought in me was this conversation I was having with a friend, and yeah, it just is like. I think that that, that element, that willingness to Mm -hmm. like, I want you to feel loved. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm willing to try, you know, I'm willing to try the thing and, and having a partner who can engage with you in that. Um, I think that is like a marker for just a viable relationship, Mm. you know, and if that willingness isn't present and I think a lot of people are experience so much, um, whether it's like trauma or coping mechanisms or whatever the combination is that creates like a level of insecurity and discomfort in themselves that if, if a partner were to be like, Hey, I would like you to, to, to speak more words of affirmation to me, for example, interpreting that as, Oh, I'm not enough. I'm never going to be enough, all this stuff. And then shutting that down. And it's not even like, it can't even be a conversation then, you know, because the willingness isn't there because the ability to go there and suspend your own, like, you know, stuff to really see your partner. And I think I'm just, I don't know, we, you and I, and like the, I think the close friendships we have and relationships we have, we operate in that willingness, Mm -hmm. like constantly, Mm -hmm. you know, I I think like, because I feel like I could go to you and be like, Sarah, I need, I need this, or this doesn't work for me. And that, that would not be like an issue. Right. But I think I'm realizing that that's not the case, like for, for everyone, a lot of people's relationships. No, it's true. It's true. And I think it's interesting though, because I do think in a lot of situations we assume people are unwilling Mm. Or like, I don't know, I've had friendships where I'm like, okay, this is kind of, I think, as deep as we're going to go. Just because like, I don't know, I assume they don't show interest in like wanting to go further. And I've often been surprised when I just kind of like, you know, get a little vulnerable and say something. Um, I don't know, like one beautiful friendship that's kind of unfolding in my life. I feel so honored because she's like, 
I see that you're willing to like hear these uncomfortable things. And so I'd like to share with you that like in this particular subject, I feel nervous to bring it up to you because I feel judged. And I was like, oh shit, I'm so glad you were able to tell me that. Like I felt so honored and so just like, I don't know, I'm gonna like cry thinking about it. Cause I was like, thank you. I want, like, I'm so grateful that you like, that must have felt really scary saying that to me because mm. you feel judged. Right. And, um, and it was just like, it's like, I don't know, just such a beautiful thing when people can do that. Obviously there are examples and we both have them in our lives. I think where, you know, what's interesting is sometimes we think a person is willing or a person thinks they're willing, but they're actually not. And that's a whole nother dynamic. Hmm. right and then it takes like years of like interacting with a person to realize that they're not actually willing to do the things that like you need to feel like Mm -hmm. safe and and good in our relationship and um maybe they have some like band-aids or things like that but um I don't know there's so many different like flavors of how all of this can like play out um but I think it's really an interesting I just love that you brought this up because it's been such a pattern in my life. Oh my God. <laughs> right. Cause like, I, like at the end of the day, right. Like the, all you can do is understand your own patterns and recognize like, where are you causing yourself pain? Like, where are you just like causing yourself your own pain? I actually had like a really good uh, interaction with Evie, my almost 11 year old. And she was dealing with some friendships that were really, I think, disappointing to her. She had these friends that she really liked, but they kept doing things that hurt her feelings. And, and it was like this whole like issue that we were just like working on constantly all last school year. And I remember we got to the point where I, I asked Evie, like, what expectations she has for the friendship and Mm. she was telling me that she wants people to treat her how she treats them and Mm -hmm. and I I, and I remember like that conversation kind of unfolded with like first of all me validating that that's like of course like the most normal thing to want people to treat you with the same consideration that you treat them but then I Mm -hmm. pointed out to her I was like Evie you are one of the most like emotionally intelligent like humans let alone like 10 year olds (laughs) on the planet that I've met and do you think that these friends are capable of operating at the level of thoughtfulness and empathy that you operate in and she was like Mm -hmm. no I don't think that they do have that and so then I was kind of like so where can you, you adjust your expectations and see them how they are instead of expecting them to act like how you would act in that situation because they're not you. And I remember that was a big aha moment for her. And she Mm. like shifted. And then when she was coming to me saying so-and-so did this thing and I was like, it does that make sense? Is that kind of in alignment with how this person behaves? And she's like, yes. Mm. And I was like, it, like, it doesn't take away the fact that that probably hurt and stuff, but this person is telling you who they are. You know, Mm -hmm. they're telling Mm -hmm. you exactly who they are and you get to decide if you want to hang out with that person or not. Like that's Mm -hmm. up to you to decide. And it was Mm -hmm. like everything that we were talking about. And I went through that with Evie and, and I think it was so good for her to just kind of, it was just the same thing. She was wanting her friends to behave in this certain way that she Mm -hmm. saw could be possible if they were more sensitive, more empathetic, more like emotionally intelligent. And she was experiencing a lot of pain because they just weren't, they were just your normal, you know, 10 year old Mm -hmm. (laughs) that wasn't operating that way. And um, yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. It reminds me though. So um, you obviously, everyone obviously, or you obviously know that I love the Enneagram. And a classic Enneagram 2, like, characteristic is to always feel like you're more thoughtful than everyone else. Uh (laughs) And, like, I remember reading this in the, like, little description of the Enneagram 2, and I was like, oh, guilty. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it was was really eye-opening for me 
to see that that's just like moving through the world. Like, all right. So one of the biggest things that I've taken away from the Enneagram that's helped me is actually reading other people's numbers and how Mm -hmm. I learn from that, like their motivations, the way they see the world, how, like what makes them tick, what are their like biggest things that are like the most important things to them. And so through that, I learned, okay, one of the most important things to me, and I don't know what Evie is, but I was obviously, um, this made me reflect on my own experiences. Like for me, it's like being thoughtful and being helpful. Like it's number two is the mm-hmm. helper and it's like giving, right, right. it's about giving and being helpful. And then, and then unhealthy to gives and gives and gives and ultimately to a place of like feeling resentful because they're like, I'm more thoughtful than everyone in my life. And I don't know what the fuck's wrong with everyone. <laughs> like this yes. is like extreme version of like how right, far right. I can take that. And, and I don't know, I've seen it in people in my family. Like they love like giving and like making big dinners for everyone. And and like putting on things and then they are left feeling like nobody helps them clean up and they're just like angry and like frustrated. And it's like, and I see myself capable of doing that too. And through like reading other people's perspectives, like I'll never forget when I like read the Enneagram four, which is you. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's how you I was exist. like, you're right. I was like, this is how you like literally like, like day to day, like I, I thought I like knew you and now I'm seeing this whole other layer and you were like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know and it just I'm made me realize that it's like, I think there might even be for me anyway, I realized there was a layer of learning that not everybody has the same priorities as me. So mm-hmm. not everybody's like purpose on earth, you know what I mean? Is to like give and be as thoughtful and considerate and like Mm. And, and cultivating like really rich relationships, like their purpose, their thing might be to be like a hardcore artist and like to create mm. this like beautiful art. And they're just like, not the most like thoughtful person. Cause it's just like, not their like number one thing. And, right. um, I don't know, for me, that was like helpful because it made me, it made me stop thinking like just everybody was like, a bunch of idiots. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Right. But seriously, like, but I, I, had, I did have yeah. a point where I was like, why? I literally would think to myself in my early 20s, like, why are people so inconsiderate? I would ne- I would think things like, I would never do X, Y, and Z. I'm so much right. more thoughtful. When right. in reality, it's like, uh, I'm kind of like creating like a pedestal or something for my, like, my own behavior and thinking that right. other people like who aren't who that isn't at the forefront of their mind constantly fall short when it's like, right. Maybe we're all just different and their number one thing isn't, isn't like being the helper and like, that's Mm -hmm. okay. You know? Yeah. That's such a huge like way to move from, yeah. Like a place of like judgment based on like your stand, the standard of your values, which are incredibly yes. important, right? Yes, exactly. And you're holding yourself to a standard mm-hmm. and you're like, why the fuck can't you hold yourself to the standard? This is like critically important because it mm-hmm. is for you. It's like, it is vital for you to experience life this way. And so it makes so much sense that when you're, that when you're not aware of that and aware of this part of you, that you'd move through life being like, all these people are so like self-absorbed. I just like, like, I thought the whole, everyone was so rude constantly. I was like, this world, where are their manners? (laughs) Right. And then when you're recognizing I have a unique value system, you know, Mm. that that doesn't necessarily translate to everybody. And I I mean, of course, you can get like nuanced and like what's just like morally like sound, you know, but Mm. I I feel that I don't know. I feel that in in a big way. I I love it. I remember when we were doing the Enneagram and learning about the two. It just made me feel like I could. um love you better and like, and, and show you how I appreciate you and also receive love from you. Like Mm -hmm. when I was like learning about the two, you know, and, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to, like, I was trying to reflect if like the four has like a similar thing. Their thing is all about being unique, which mm-hmm. is just like not, and we're categorized as a four. It's like, I know. It's, like, and then when I found out all my students were fours, they were like, what the hell? 
Right. No. It's so funny. The worst no. possible thing I mean, you can do to a four don't, don't is call them a four. Me. <laughs> it's so funny. But it it is so valuable. And there's like there's tests that you can take online, um, free tests where you can find out your Enneagram, but it is hugely valuable. And I feel like I've been able to move through the world understanding my value system better and mm. And seeing when that shows up negatively, you know, because I yes. can definitely that that desire for this in this like unique, independent, um, the the four is the individualist can sometimes, uh, you know, I mean, I'm like it, it can sometimes drive me to make choices to make sure that I'm standing out from the crowd or I'm separate in some ways. And, mm -hmm. and being aware mm -hmm. of that has helped me be like, is this good for me? Or can I just like get over myself here and like, let it be whatever yes. it is, you know? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. And for me, it was like a big, I realized a ton of judgments were, were hung mm. on the fact that I thought everyone, everyone's core values should be to help everyone else. Like, I just was like, mm. so anyone who had a, had chosen a career that wasn't like helping other people, I was like, how dare you? <laughs> like, mm. I was such a 20 year old Sarah I was a judgmental little asshole. Like, <laughs> I, was, uh, I just was like, I had such a, like, a strong filter, like lens on. And it was like through my own beliefs, which is like what I think most people, like most people do. Default. Because it's, it's like, unless, default. yeah, default yeah. is to like judge yeah. everything through your own belief system and think there's no space for other belief systems when it is like clearly not true. Like look around at the world. We've got different belief right. systems. We've got different priorities and we made a whole podcast about it. So it's clearly yes, like did make a whole podcast very important, it. very important to us anyway. Yes. Oh, I love really. this. I love this topic. It's been such a pattern in my life. So. I was very mm -hmm. happy to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think that the more with, with this, I don't know, idea, the more it, it is so empowering to me when I can uncover and discover areas where I am causing my own self pain and other people pain, as opposed to we can also default to being like, this is this other person. It's because they behave this way. It's because they, and putting it outside. And that actually is very, feels very powerless because you have no control over that person. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. th this person might not all of a sudden decide to speak your love language someday, or all of a sudden decide to meet your needs. And if you can like bring that back into like, what am I doing? Um, it's so empowering, I think, um, because then you can make, cause the, the only thing you have control over is yourself and then you can make the adjustments you need or have the conversations that you need to have. Um, but staying in that place of like, I have no control over this and this person just is like not meeting my needs or not doing whatever. I can't connect with them in the way I want or that meets my expectations. That's really disempowering. And I think it's like, totally. it's really good to evaluate like, where is that showing up? Where are you doing that? How can you shift that pattern into something that's a lot more empowering to your, how you engage. And then, and then I think my, my like, I guess my like last thought about this is like how to broach conversations. I think it's really important that if you are going to have a conversation with somebody about wanting some sort of adjustment or pointing out an area that you feel like you would like to be loved in this way or, or, or whatever the need is coming from a place that's like a need and the, the motivation is for the betterment of the relationship. And it's not just like a pet peeve. Um, I think it's critically important that you don't have that conversation when you're triggered and kicked up. That's when people tend to want to have that conversation is you get triggered because they didn't do the thing. And you're like, you, you always do this to me, da, 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 all that stuff. And that's the worst time you can have that conversation because the per other person is instantly going to go on the default. The best thing you can do is notice, wow, this is the thing. This is where I'm getting kicked up and just make a mental note that when I'm calm, I can have like a compassionate conversation with this person about that. It's just so important to not try to ask for, 
for your needs from a pl- from a triggered place because it just that's not gonna it's not gonna land how you really want it to land you know yeah for sure and this is something I'm like constantly working on because I tend to be my like fight or flight reaction is like fight for sure and so I tend to want to have that conversation from that place because <laughs> the energy While is there yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and so I've actually started started saying because I'm I also feel like I'm more it's weird it's like when you're not in that place you almost like tend to want to not have the conversation because it's it's charged and things feel calm and you don't want to go into conflict you don't want to yeah yeah and so it's like it's harder and and also I tend to feel like more awkward and vulnerable and for me that doesn't feel as good I'd rather be all charged up and like feel like my protectors are like out and ready to like protect me so I've started prefacing it with like just calling that out and that's helped me a lot where I'm just like I want to have a conversation and and the other thing I used to I tend to do is like waiting for the perfect time to like bring up the thing when in reality it's like the perfect time is going to be like when there's already conflict in my mind which isn't the perfect time right because it's like why would I want to (laughs) disturb why would I want to disturb this peace that we've got going on and so I've just started calling it out and being like I got to bring this up because it's like on my mind and I want to bring it up when I'm not upset and uh mm. and like just like and just saying that like starting there mm-hmm. um that's so good because it's like really important for me to do that and also yeah. for me yeah. a big one has been calling out like I want to I want to call it out before it gets any bigger because that's the thing that happens mm. is you for a lot of people I think you don't say anything until you reach like a boiling point where you suddenly feel like you mm-hmm. can't wait anymore and you have to say something and that's not mm-hmm. the best place to do things from. <laughs> so right. It's like right. calling that out, being place. like, yeah, I, this isn't maybe that big of a deal right now, but I can feel it kind of building and growing. And I just want to like call it out so it doesn't get any bigger. Um, right. I don't know. That's been so helpful for that's me. That's such a way you can like love your person too, is like, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm stepping into this like uncomfortable, vulnerable space because I'm really wanting to protect us from some future explosion. You know, this is Mm -hmm. like, like, that's like a way that you're like loving your relationship and caring for your relationship, which is so good and so important. Um, yes, this is a good one. And I think it's going to make me wonder, it's going to make me wonder like, where am I still doing this? Cause it's never, you never get anything perfect. You go in and out of doing it, Mm -hmm. of doing the thing. Mm-hmm. And recognizing it sooner and it's not something yes. I think you just like forever get rid of. I think it almost is like it needs yeah. to be addressed in every new relationship you build. Like it's it's kind of like mm-hmm. Yeah, like looking at it in every connection because I think it can be present because it's so it's such a default mechanism in us to want to, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um and I, I do love that part of like people that can dream up some beautiful mm-hmm. reality, you know, and, and, but I think like in order for that ever to, to even be close for that to parts of that to be realized, it's not going to happen by making your person feel like you're disappointed in them constantly. <laughs> like it's like that only is going to like that growth and that comfort to maybe get to a more whole healed place is going to come from you like fucking loving them exactly how they are, you know, and, and championing mm-hmm. them to like, when they have their own self motivated, like, I want to do better, I want to be better, you know, and like, being there for them and that but yes, it's a good one. I think that's it's a big really lesson you learn, uh, you learn mm-hmm. when you go through addiction is that like, because people often will come to me and be like, I have this person that I love in my life who's struggling with addiction. How do I get them to like stop? And I'm like, you don't, it's like gotta come from within them. And like, that is like one area that is like in my life that has, that has taught me that like Mm. on a deep, deep level, like no one, no one can like get somebody else to like get help in that way. Yeah. And like, yeah, unfortunately they have to get to a place where they like, 
are so disgusted with themselves that they like want to do that and it's Mm -hmm. like so awful to watch but yeah it's like it's true in other areas that are less like harmful and dramatic and and Mm -hmm. and yeah but it but but it's like it's like a deep truth like you cannot force other people to to value something to want to change to want to better themselves you just can't Mm -hmm. so all you can do is like love the shit out of them yeah and manage your own expectations yes oof yeah, that is a feeling. It's hard. It's hard when it's you see so somebody hard. hurt themselves, right? I know. <laughs> you know. I know. But yeah, that's what those people need the most because they probably already feel like a fucking disappointment in themselves. Oh, yes. So, like, oh yeah, just loving them where they're at, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. I'm good, sorry. good, good. Well. Um, we're supposed to say our podcast manager wants us to say that we have a Patreon and we oh, have, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, we, I, there's like a list. We of have a Patreon. We're doing, <laughs> we have a Patreon. Oh, really? Innerarchaeology.com backslash, nope, patreon.com backslash innerarchaeology. <laughs> and then we also We're learning. Have, we're growing. We, we're learning. We also have, like, we're on all, so many different platforms. So wherever you're listening. Oh, yeah. We, also we have been video bad podcasts. about this. I know. Hey, we can actually watch us. Thing. We're you about to be watch on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're on YouTube. Uh, innerarchaeology.com has our, like, all the different links that you can get to listen to it. Um, audio version. And then innerarchaeology.tv is how you can find us on video. So. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So lots of options. we've been doing video for a while and haven't told anyone about it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> one day we're gonna get. One day we're gonna start promoting ourselves. But right we're like, now, why do you guys just not know friends. that we have video? <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> wondering why people aren't aware of it. Because <laughs> you have to tell people. Weird. Like apparently, you yeah. have to tell people. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like I'm in marketing or something and should know these things, <laughs> right? Like. <laughs> so fun. Uh, uh, I love you. That's well, I love you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Until, Until next time, next my friends. Time. Bye. Bye.